Hey everyone, in today's video, I'm gonna be showing you all how to build your own ambient light TV. Now, this is something that I've been wanting to do as a personal project for a long time. And now that I'm finally getting around to it, I figured, hey, I should probably film this as well so you guys can all achieve this awesome ambient lighting effect on your TV or monitor using a Raspberry Pi and the program Hyperion. But we'll get more on that later. So without further ado, let's just get started. So to kick things off before I get to the part list, I figured I'd give you all the nitty gritty on like how much this is going to cost. So really it depends on the hardware that you're going to be using and some of you may already have some of the parts on hand already which would decrease your cost. But for me this was around $200 and that's because I had nothing on hand. But I also did go overboard in a few places which you'll see later in the video. And secondly, what we're doing here today specifically is setting up an external device like a game console to work with the Hyperion application. This method will not work with apps that are pre-built into your TV, like if you have a Roku TV, for example. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the part list. So the first thing we're going to need is a Raspberry Pi. Specifically, I'm using the Raspberry Pi 3 Model A+. You can get these as part of a kit on eBay for about $50. Just make sure you have an SD card to go along with it, preferably nothing smaller than four gigabytes. And optionally, you can get a case for the Raspberry Pi, which will make mounting the device later a little easier. I did buy one, but it's currently still on its way, so you'll probably see it later in the video. An HDMI capture card. I bought this for $10 on eBay and it actually works pretty well. I'll leave a link down below for all the parts mentioned today. Next up, a WS2812B LED strip. So with this, the price fluctuates based on the size of your TV or monitor. I'm using a 65 inch TV today, so I bought a 16 foot 300 LED count strip, and this was about $30. A power supply. I'm going with a five volt 15 amp power supply, and I bought this one from Amazon for about $20. Now, honestly, you probably don't need to go as high as 15 amps for this. You can most likely get away with an eight amp power supply, but I figured I would go on the higher side with this one. An HDMI splitter. Now this part may vary for you depending on how many outputs you want. So for me, I'm connecting this to my Xbox Series S because it's my most used console in the living room, which is used for gaming and apps like Netflix and Hulu. So because that's all I want and need, I went with the Rocketfish two output HDMI splitter with 4K Ultra HD and HDR compatibility. I actually bought this one from Best Buy for $70, but the thing worth noting is you'll need at least two outputs when doing this. One for your console or any other device that you're using, and one for the Raspberry Pi. A DC barrel jack adapter. These are cheap to find. I bought a pack of these for about $8, and this is where I said I went a little overboard. You don't have to grab a pack of these. You know, you can just buy, they might sell a four pack or something like that, which would be a lot cheaper. Um, next up, two male to female DuPont connectors. I bought a pack of these as well for $8. Next, a micro USB cable that we can use as a sacrifice. We just want to make sure when we strip the ends that we can use the power and ground wires from the cable. And lastly, some Velcro strips that I bought from Walmart for $2 that we can use to mount the Pi to the TV. Additionally, things to make your life a little bit easier would be some scissors and a wire stripper. Now I know the part list seems like it's kind of a lot, but I promise you this is actually pretty easy to get all set up. So the first thing that we're gonna start with is with the LED strip. We just wanna measure it and see if we can get the exact length that we're gonna be using on the TV. And once we achieve the length that we want to get, we're gonna go ahead and snip the ends. And now we are done with the LED strip for now. So let's just go ahead and head over and start configuring the Raspberry Pi. And now we need to head over to the PC and download the application Hyperban, which is Hyperion already pre-installed into the Raspberry Pi OS Lite. Now all we have to do is just hit the download button here and download the zip. And again, I'll leave a link for everything that I'm using in the description below. Now that that's downloaded, we're just gonna right click it, go to show in folder, and we're gonna take this over to the desktop. On the Hyperban zip, we're gonna right click it and go to extract to Hyperban. And now the next program you're gonna need is the Raspberry Pi Imager. I'll leave a link for this as well, but you can get this from the Raspberry Pi official website. Once you have that downloaded, we're gonna start off by choosing our operation system. We're gonna go down and select Use Custom. 
and it's going to take us to our downloads folder. So let me just go ahead and go back one and you're going to see the hyperband folder that was already extracted earlier. Inside we have the image file. We're going to click that. And now we're going to select our storage. I have my SD card mounted as G. You can see it's 32 gigabytes. I'm going to select that. And lastly, we're going to hit this cog wheel here, and this is going to set up some additional things for us, like set a host name, enable SSH. You can set a username and a password. For me, my username will be Pi, and my password will be Pi. We're also going to configure my wireless LAN, which already has my password and information in there. Select your wireless LAN country, which we need to roll to the US almost there almost there there it is and then we're gonna select our local settings which this is my time zone here and I'm gonna hit everything looks good here I'm gonna hit the save button and now we can just hit right it's going to tell you all the data currently on the SD card is going to be erased so just make sure you're using an empty card formatted to FAT32 so just press yes to continue. And this is probably gonna take about five to 10 minutes. So I'll see you when this is done. Okay, and once it's all done, it's just gonna tell you to eject your SD card. And if you do that, we're gonna put that into the Raspberry Pi and power it up. With that being said, we need a way to connect to the Raspberry Pi. So I have the application putty here. Again, I'll leave everything in the description below. And in order to access the Pi, we're going to need either our host name or the IP address of the Pi. Now, earlier, we actually did set a host name, and that was Raspberry Pi dot local. I'm just going to hit enter. And it's going to say login as we created the username Pi and the password Pi. And you can see we're logged into Hyperband. Now, the first thing we have to do once we're in here is enable the GPIO pins because natively they will not work unless you're running as a root user, which Hyperban is not, to my knowledge anyways. So in order to do that, we need to do sudo systemctl disable dash dash now and Hyperion at pi. This will disable that user. And now we need to enable the root user. So to do that, that's sudo systemctl enable dash dash now, and it's gonna be hyperion at root, Hit enter. And now that this is done, we should be able to use our GPIO pins. The last bit of advice that I can give is if you're having a problem connecting to the internet, you could type in sudo raspy dash config and this will take you to a whole setup information here where you can set up the localization options like your uh, wlan county if you set this up correctly nine times out of ten that should fix your issue so now let's go ahead and head over to setting everything up now so now we can actually install our led strip to the tv by removing the adhesive sticker that's on the back and then just running it up the tv now there are multiple ways to uh, say cut the corners on your TV. Uh, you can cut the strips into fours and then connect them with wires via soldering. Or you can just do it the lazy way and fold the corners. Personally, this doesn't bother me and I'm probably not going to notice the difference, but you can do it the proper way if you'd like. It's also worth noting that they sell clips that you can just attach these to to make your life a little easier. But like I said, I'm going to be going with this method for the remainder of the TV. Once we got to the end of the TV, I purposefully left a little extra just in case I was a little off when I was measuring earlier. So now all I have to do is just snip off the access by cutting it on the copper line. And once that's done, we'll just stick it down. And I stopped it a little short because I figured if I made it go under the wire, the wires would be obstructing the light. So I just made it a little shy from the corner. And this is how it looks with the LED strips all applied to the TV. So now what we want to do is find out where we want to mount our Raspberry Pi. Ideally, it should be connected closest to your HDMI ports on your TV or, you know, wherever your power outlets are going to be located, whatever would be easiest for you. But I found this side of the TV actually works pretty well for me. It's a big open space, so I'm probably going to mount it here. Now you can see I just went ahead and slapped a Velcro strip right on here. 
And I also put a Velcro strip on the back of the Raspberry Pi, which now has the case that I mentioned earlier. This came in. Anyways, uh, with the strip on here, I'm just gonna press it on here, see how firm it is, make sure it's not gonna drop, make sure it'll hold all the connections that we're gonna put into it. And now we can get to using our sacrificial USB cable that we also mentioned earlier. You're gonna notice on this one, I already have the ends stripped and we have a white and a red wire revealed. This may be different for your cable, uh, what's important that's worth noting is that red is the power and white or black is usually the ground. And those are the only two ones we're gonna need on there. You may see green, green I believe is the data wire. You're not gonna want or need that. The next thing we're gonna do is connect this up using a barrel jack connector to the LED strip. And you're gonna notice on the ends here, I already have the wires stripped. And it's also worth noting that I'm using the female end of the strip with the male end being cut off. And also, if you take a look at the wires, you're gonna see that there are arrows pointing away. That is the data flow pointing away from the power source, which is what we want. You don't want those arrows pointing back at you. So now connecting it to the barrel jack connector is actually pretty easy. On the end of the LED strip, you should notice that you have a white and red wire that's just hanging off. That is also your power and ground wire. What we're gonna do is take the power wire from the micro USB cable, the red wire, and connect it to the red wire of the LED strip. All we have to do to do that is just fray out the ends, twist them together, and then we can shove them into the barrel jack connector. And once it's in the connector, all you have to do is just tighten it up with a screwdriver. You can tell which end is positive or negative on the barrel jack connector by just looking at the front, there should be a plus or minus symbol on there. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the grounding wire, which was the white cable on my micro USB cord and the white cable on the LED strip. Again, this may be white and black for you if you're using a different micro USB cable, but it's the same thing. Just fray out the ends, twist them together a little bit, and then shove them into the negative side of the barrel jack connector and tighten it up. Okay, now we can start talking about connections. So I have the HDMI splitter right in front of me, and I'm gonna show you how this is connected. I have the Pi mounted to the TV, and I have the HDMI capture card that I purchased earlier plugged into the USB port on the Raspberry Pi, which goes into one of the outputs on the HDMI splitter. Additionally, another output that I have goes directly into the TV. After that, the middle wire, which is the input, is connected to my Xbox Series S, which is right underneath it in the cabinet. Now we're going to take our micro USB cord and plug that in as well. It should be obvious at this point that we chopped off the actual USB end of the cord. Now we're going to set up some DuPont connectors. You're going to take the DuPont connector and plug it into the sixth pin from the top on the right which is the GPIO 18 pin. And now for the male end, we're gonna go down to the LED strip and you're gonna see we have the female end of the wire here. We're gonna plug this directly into the middle, at least for this strip, this is the data connection that will transfer basically what Hyperion sees to the LED strip. Uh, this is also what we enabled earlier when we had to log in as the root user. Additionally, I also added a grounding cable to the GPIO 6 pin, which is the third from the top from the right. And what I did with this was connect this to the end wire, not the red wire on the LED strip, just to leave a grounding connection because I noticed later in the video when I practiced with the lights that I was getting a flickering effect. So grounding the pin seemed to fix my issue. And now we can finally plug this in and test this. I have my power brick on the floor and I'm just gonna plug it in. Now this does usually take a bit to register. It's worth noting that the Raspberry Pi does have a red and green light on it, so it does have power. Uh, it takes a second for the lights to register, so they should turn on here any second. Um, what usually happens is that all the power has to go into the capture card, you know, the Pi has to turn on, and then it's gotta actually capture the connection from the device, which again, in my case, is my Xbox. So oh, there it is, and you can see we have the strip running. We do have some additional things that we need to change within the Hyperion settings because it's most likely not gonna work off rip. And we're also gonna have to make note of the actual LED count of the strip that's on the back of the TV. So this means going through and going on the top or the sides of the TV and counting all the individual strips in a row. We wanna know how many LEDs are on the right side, how many LEDs are on the left side and the top, 
and the bottom. Okay, so now in order to actually change the settings within Hyperion, all we have to do is open the browser of our choice and type in either the IP address of our Raspberry Pi or the host name. So if you remember for me earlier, that was raspberrypi.local colon, and we're gonna do 8090. Once you hit enter, it should take you to a Hyperion uh, user interface that we can use to make all the adjustments that we're gonna need here. So starting off, we have a bunch of configurations that we're gonna make here. So we are on the dashboard, which initially tells you your first LED hardware instance. It'll confirm if your status is on or off, component status, uh, your capturing hardware, everything we're using here, which is obviously disabled. We're gonna have to change all this. So let's start off with general. And here, really, I'm not gonna touch this page, but if you're planning on having this installed in your bedroom, your living room, and another room after that, you're gonna wanna set up um, multiple configuration names and uh, instant names. But for me, this says first LED hardware instant instance, and I'm only planning on having this in the living room, so I'm gonna leave this as is. Next, we're gonna go to the LED instances and go to LED output. From here, this is where we're gonna to need to select our actual LEDs. So if you go to controller type, you scroll up to the top, you're gonna to see WS281X. This is the 2812B LED strip that we bought. So I'm gonna select that. And it's gonna ask you for your maximum LED count. Now this is where our count comes in earlier that I mentioned. And I know that in total, I actually have 258. So it was close to what we have here connected to the GPIO uh, number 18 pin. Uh, everything else we're pretty much gonna leave here. And the hardware LED count, we're gonna set that to the same thing. We're gonna do 258. Then we're gonna hit save settings. And it's gonna give you this message here, but it's only because we're not done. So I'm just gonna do continue. We're gonna go over to LED layout, classic layout. And this is where we can actually individually set everything. So I have 82 LEDs on the top. 82 LEDs on the bottom, 47 going up the sides, and you're gonna to wanna to set an input position. Now the input position is pretty much where the data starts on your TV. Now this view that you're seeing here should be your television set, and this is from looking at the screen, not from looking behind the TV. So I have mine placed, let's see, hit the arrow keys, you should be able to move this gonna go forward. Unfortunately, you can't go backwards. You gotta go around the map here. It's the Monopoly shit. Ah. And I actually have mine installed pretty much at the bottom of the screen like you guys saw. So I'm gonna leave mine right there. And I think you have an option to reverse direction, but this is if your LED strip isn't working. We have to test that first to make sure everything is set up. So I'm not gonna reverse the direction yet. I'm just gonna save the LED layout. And you'll see this time when we save, we didn't have any issues. So the next thing we're gonna have to do is go down into our sources and you're gonna see we have enable screen capture, USB capture and audio capture and they're all unchecked. We're gonna have to change that by going into capturing hardware. We're gonna go into USB capture, check activate. It's gonna discover your device and you can see I have USB video here gonna ask you your device resolution. Typically when you do your resolution, you're gonna want it to be as low as possible because you're not capturing the actual video, you're capturing the colors. So 640 by 480 by default for me is what I'm gonna use, but I am gonna increase this to 30 frames per second. You also have the option to crop everything, but I'm just gonna hit save settings from there. And just to confirm, we're gonna go back into LED instances, output, LED layout, and we're gonna select live video here. And now you can see that it is picking up something. That is my Xbox. I think it's sleeping. Let me see if I can unsleep it. Now that I fixed that, you can actually see that it's picking up the visuals. While we're here, another thing worth noting is that you can actually switch the settings level of Hyperion. So if you go into expert, for example, you're gonna have tons of more options. So if we go to our LED controller, everything has kind of changed a little bit. We have an option to invert our signal, um, change the RGB byte order, which we are actually for this. So instead of RGB, we are going to do GRB. Then after that, we're just gonna hit save settings. And now we're gonna go over to capturing hardware. Uh, your device discovered, you're gonna select the USB device from your um, Raspberry Pi. It should be visible here. 
and it's gonna ask you your encoding format. This doesn't matter. Device resolution, for this, you wanna keep this as low as possible because we're not actually capturing the video. We're just trying to capture the colors. So 640 by 480 is good for me. 30 frames per second is also good for me. Uh, what else do we have here? And we're also gonna check signal detection. After that, we're just gonna save the settings and let's scroll back up to the top and see what else we have. The next thing we can do is head back over to LED instances, go to image processing, and you can see we can change the brightness or add brightness gain. I'm actually gonna add three to mine and then hit save. And I think that would be good for me. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's all the settings we have to change for now. So what we're gonna do is just reboot the system. We can just open up putty real fast and then do sudo reboot. And this should restart our Pi, and then we should notice that our lights are now working on our TV. So let's go ahead and take a look. And everything seems to be working pretty well. I did put on a simple video here just to kind of showcase the tracking of the LEDs as they go with the image on the screen. If you have any issues with this, like let's say the image is on the left side of your screen, but the right LEDs are lighting up, you can reverse your signal to change that uh, within the settings. You can also go into the uh, Hyperion settings, click the magic wand icon at the top, and you have an option for the RGB byte order wizard. Uh, if you hit continue on this, what it will do is make your TV flash this color, or it'll change to green in a few seconds. And basically it'll just have you verify that when this color is written on here, that'll actually show up on the screen. So if it's red, it's red. If it's on your screen, if it's green and it's red, you'd select it here and this should uh, change your issue. But again, what we just did earlier within the LED output, um, where was that? Right here, the RGB byte order, this would also fix it, which is why I changed it to GRB. Uh, yeah, let's get back to what we were looking at. And I just wanna showcase a couple of interesting things that really I think show off and, and make this pop. So I did record a couple of games of just me moving around through certain ambient settings. And let me tell you, so far, this has given me a new experience playing the Ocarina of Time. It just gives it a whole new vibe and I think makes it just a little more enjoyable and, and fun to play. Um, I also did record games like Skyrim, for example. You could see in this hallway, the light ambience of the room is actually going as I walk with my character. And once I get to the darker part of the hall, the lights turn off. But when I use my flame spells, neither my right hand or my left hand, you're gonna see those corners of the screen actually light up. And then if I do a shout, see the whole TV light up. And I think that's a really awesome effect. And lastly, I'm just gonna show you guys a clip of this thunderstorm here. And you can see the actual responsiveness of when the lightning's coming out on the screen. You can, just the flash on the back of the TV, I just think it's really awesome. But I think I'm gonna start wrapping the video up here. Uh, if you guys run into any trouble, leave a comment down below. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And that's it for me. I will see you guys in the next video. Adios.